I'd like to start by saying I'm far more concerned with the physics saviour of our air conditioning system in here than humanity. Um, I've got two of my favourite physicists on the board there, um, Isaac, the late great Isaac Newton and the great and also fictional Dr Sheldon Cooper. Um, more from them later. I'm going to start by talking about mistakes. Some of the great mistakes that have been made over about the past 150, 200 years. 1962, Decca Records executive on turning down the Beatles for a record deal. A bit, a bit later on, what is this telephone thing we hear of? This is Western Union's genuine opinion on the telephone the first time it happened. Moving a bit more modern, and with this one I want you to think about how many computers there are in your family home. There's more than five computers in that standard university IT suite. Um, anyone here an iPhone user? Yeah, Steve Ballmer feels pretty foolish. The truth is, all of these mistakes pale into comparison with a mistake made right at the start of the last century by Baron Lord Kelvin, British physicist. And he says this. He is speaking uh, not by any means the end of the Industrial Revolution, but when the Industrial Revolution has shown what it can do. Physics feels and science feels that it has mastered its destiny. We have made the steam engine. We have access to enormous amounts of energy. We are producing steel in blast furnaces. Industry is booming. And we think we have done it all, and he could not have been more wrong. And he starts to go wrong just two or three years later, when this woman, Marie Curie, discovers that the atom, atom coming from the Greek word for individable, atom being a constant, solid, undividable thing, is in fact unstable and breaks down and is not permanent at all. She remains to this day the only woman to have won two Nobel Prizes. She's the first ever person to have won two Nobel Prizes and is the only person to have won it in two different sciences. Alongside her, a few years later, Ernst Rutherford, working at the University of Manchester, performs an experiment with gold foil and alpha particles. You do not need to know the details. All you need to know is that his results were the equivalent of you taking a tennis ball throwing it against a brick wall and it going straight through. We perceive atoms to be solid, solid things. And what we found is that they are mostly empty space. So within 10 years of Kelvin's prediction, our stable, tangible, solid atom has lost all three of those ideas. It takes this man, Albert Einstein, in his Annus Mirabilis, 1905, to help her, to give us the first step to dealing with this new information. He published three papers that year. The Theory of Relativity, his most famous work, didn't win a Nobel Prize. A paper on Brownian motion that actually proved for the first time that atoms existed using obscure biological data that nothing to do with anything he was studying, that didn't win a Nobel Prize. What he won a Nobel Prize for is proving effective that when you got physics down to the atomic, molecular, really small level, it was not the same. He showed us, through his photoelectric experiment, that we needed a new theory. Now, these three people have had an amazing effect on the course of physics, but actually, as important to physics as any scientist is the First World War. I've picked that image of the First World War for a very specific reason. This is an image of soldiers blinded by mustard gas. The First World War was the first war where we saw chemical warfare, and it was the first war that was truly industrial in scale. That industrial revolution was now being put to death and war. And chemistry was now a science of pain and suffering and injury and death. And that drove physics theoretical. That new theory that, those new ideas about atoms, that became a goal because it felt safe. It felt away from the industry. It felt away from the First World War. You end up in 1927 with a conference. If, you've ever, if you're a fan of a sport and you imagine your dream team of that sport, your world first 11 in football or your world first 15 in rugby, this is physics's dream team. 
Genuinely, this is the 1927 Solvoy Conference, and that is where the idea of quantum mechanics and the standard model, our current understanding, our revolutionary understanding of the physics of the very small comes from. Now, this is an incredibly innocent time, and this innocence is soon to be lost. And maybe the first hint that this is not a benign, safe, and altogether theoretical thing comes in 1954 when Marie Curie dies of what was effectively radiation poisoning. Her notes and her cookbook are to this day still so radioactive that they can't be handled without protective gear. But she had no idea that what we, they were doing was so dangerous. And I'm going to skip forward 11 years here and take you to 1945 when the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Robert Oppenheimer, head of the Manhattan Project, used these, these words, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. So as chemistry lost its innocence in the First World War, physics loses its innocence in the Second World War, and that actually drives it forward. There are two sides to this slide, because physics at this point enters a dichotomy. It slips from the very theoretical over here and becoming more and more mathematical and trying to, without doing any experiment, without getting anything practical or dangerous, bring us a greater understanding of the universe. But also, this is the era of the largest government investment in science ever in real terms. NASA, the space race, Sputnik, man on the moon. If you are really, really cynical, you will believe that it is done entirely to test the ballistic missiles for the Cold War. But actually, that doesn't matter. We've ended up with the space race and theoretical physics coming out of that. I'm going to change tack now. I'm going to talk about the future. This is how physics will save humanity. That is a potted history of why we are where we are today. Um, there are two great problems facing the world at the moment. We're incredibly worried about global warming, and we're worried about overpopulation. Um, this is a calculation I did this morning. Um, I was born on the 3rd of June 1988. And there were 5.1 billion people on this planet. According to a delightful website called deathclock.com, which if you enter certain details, will predict for you the day in which you're going to die, and that's mine, there will be about 10 billion people on the Earth by then. Global warming. This is my best piece of evidence for global warming here. I'm not here to discuss whether it's real or not. I personally think it is. It doesn't matter to me. Um, all I'm going to show you is this next graph. Look at the purple and the green and the red. We are getting all our energy from fossil fuels. Even if you don't believe in it, they are going to run out. We cannot sustain 10 billion people in developed countries on this much energy, or with fossil fuel energies. So where does physics come in? It could provide a solution to any one of these. You've got wind power, which involves harnessing the gravity of the moon um, on the sea, and finding a way that's incredibly complicated and actually efficiently getting that power from there onto the shore. We could try and harness the power of that is in the centre of the Earth efficiently, and in countries that aren't just on fault lines. The wind turbine is an incredibly clever thing, but it is deeply inefficient, and it is physics' job to improve that further. And the solar panel, again, the physics of them, I'm not going to go into the details, is at the moment very clever, but also very much in its basic step. Those are four ways. These are our standard renewable energies. But I don't actually think this is how physics is going to save the world. It could do, but this is not what I think. I'm just missing the stop of that, I think it is going to save the world through nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is possibly the most powerful energy source available to us at the moment. It is what fuels the sun, it is the combining of small atoms into big ones, and that releases the energy that fuels it. It is tried and tested in the form of, as we've seen before, physics making its advances through weapons. That is the most powerful nuclear fusion bomb we've ever used. Compare that down there, it's zoomed in, 
the bomb on Hiroshima. That's entering the upper atmosphere and getting towards space. That's how powerful it is. It is powerful enough to provide the sun. If we do this, if we get this working, we have a limitless source of clean energy. Now, there are challenges. This looks like the warp core of the Starship Enterprise. It is not the warp core of the Starship Enterprise. Apparently, someone told me today, the Starship Enterprise isn't real. Um, this is actually in a laboratory about 20 miles to the southwest of here called JET. This is the UK's most advanced fusion reactor and one of the most advanced in the world. It is coping with the immense pressure, the immense temperature, and the huge magnetic fields you need to make nuclear fusion happen. It is, in many ways, using everything that that history lesson I gave you has given us. Because we still need to further our theoretical understanding. We are still going to have to have a better theory behind physics before we can master nuclear fusion, which I believe is our energy source. And to do that, we're going to need to do experiments. Now, when we went to space, we were exploring. But what we didn't know is we were opening the most advanced laboratory that we could possibly find. Nuclear fusion happens in extremes, and there is nowhere more extreme available to humanity than outer space. There is nothing more powerful we can study than a star or a black hole. And therefore, that gives us the laboratory, and that gives us the ideas. Our final th my final thought is this. We are trying to harness the power of the stars down on Earth. One day, we are going to outgrow this rock. Physics is going to have to be the thing that gets us up there. So, I'm going to leave you with the words of Sheldon Cooper. Good night, and if there's an apocalypse, good luck. Thank you.